Hi, my name is Dennis. Welcome to Foundation's AWS Cloud Models and Shared Responsibilities Overview. Let's get started. Our learning objectives today include understanding the various service categories, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service, so IF, PaaS, and SaaS. All these offerings are specifically what we'll be discussing with AWS, but IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS are really across cloud compatible standardized terminologies across the industry. We'll also learn about AWS and customer responsibilities at the different service levels and what's required from us as a customer as them as a provider for different security requirements. We'll also be able to explain the benefits of hub and spoke architecture and why we have to have multiple accounts, not just single accounts with a wide enterprise that we're making business solutions for. So service scopes and responsibilities. Cloud strategies include different components, different services. So when you talk about cloud service categories, we actually talk about it in three different main categories. Infrastructure as a service, which pretty much says, hey, we're gonna lift and ship everything from whatever you do in the data center today, just in the cloud. So think of virtual, ma virtual machines, hypervisors over there. So let's look at that a little bit more carefully here. On site, you have everything in the full stack. You are in charge of everything from A to Z the power, the data center, the cooling, the servers, logistics, people, all of that, all the way through the application to the end user. But the IaaS, all that's being taken care of and delineated by AWS. So at the IaaS level, no hardware requirements for you. You have to maintain the operating system, the middleware, the runtime, the data, and the application still. And then, although that doesn't seem like much, that's still quite a bit. Our next service up is really another type of platform. That's called platform as a service, PaaS. And what that really means, you're actually operating things at the runtime and higher. When we say runtime at higher, that means dependencies, libraries, anything that it takes for your application to run, like installation of environments, for instance. Uh, if you're using Ubuntu, the Bash shell, if you're creating your Bash shell scripts, those are a runtime environment. So the OS, all the patching, all the heating, cooling, all that stuff that goes below that is actually the provider's requirements, the AWS side. Finally, the creme de la creme, which is what we all are accustomed to seeing is SaaS. So if you're using Zoom, if you're using Office 365, if you're using anything that is made for you as an end user to utilize, you don't really uh, have any responsibility towards that. You have no responsibility of maintaining, patching, providing updates, code releases, or anything of that nature. You just simply have to use the product. Now, with that in mind, you have the least amount of control. You have the most amount of control here at the data center operation level, and you have the least amount of control at the SaaS level. Most providers and most uh, workloads across different customers use a combination of IaaS and PaaS for a good chunk of their workloads. And when I say workloads, I mean applications. But remember, workloads are more than just an application. A workload can mean multiple applications. Just like when there's a business function, there's multiple applications that support that business function. Human resources might have an insurance application, a benefits application, and a process intake application for new candidates. All those are separate applications, but one workload requirement for HR. Now again, IaaS requires you to have pretty much everything except for the virtualization underlying hardware. PaaS is kind of that nice middleman in between where it says, I'm gonna provide you the OS, the runtime, and everything you need to run your application. You still have to provide the data. And finally, uh, pretty much using only the software as a service, which is pretty much cloud-based software, uh, things like your mobile applications that are transparent to you as a user, that is full SaaS. So remember that when you look at migrations and other patterns related to cloud service categories, think about this. If, you're, if your company is moving from on-site only to a cloud-based hybrid environment, the fastest way to do so is use IaaS services. IS services allow you to have that lift and shift where you're just saying, hey, be in charge of my data center hardware requirements only. I'm in charge of everything else, and I don't have to reprogram or recreate, also creating a refactor for my applications. When I refactor my application, that means I'm really just saying I also have the requirement to change my architecture to be compatible with potentially these two types of services. Keep that in mind as you're doing your migrations between different environments. Now, IaaS, again, a little bit deeper into this. How does that work and why would we use it? Well, one thing is for, just like as mentioned previously, migration speed, but also price point. 
price point of a lift and shift of a migration might be less upfront. It might cost you more in the long run, but it might meet your immediate needs today with, with your business requirements. Or it might meet your infrastructure needs where you need to have replication for compliance requirements or disaster recovery. These are still great avail uh, availabilities for you, and you don't have to restrict yourself to using only platform as a service or software as a service. Infrastructure as a service has its benefits too. For instance, if you're a Microsoft shop and you're using Active Directory, Active Directory being the login authentication piece with domain controllers and the exchange servers, which is pretty much your email servers. For those of you who are fairly new to the information technology field, Exchange has been around for a long time. However, Office 365 and the cloud is being pushed nowadays, so you have to utilize mostly uh, a hybrid environment whenever you're looking for this. Most Microsoft shops have moved to a hybrid environment, and this is what this depiction shows case. We still have our data center. We're not getting rid of all of IT. But we want to also say we want to reduce costs. Let's say we want to create a DR, a disaster recovery, or business continuity planning active site. We need to have replication going, but we want to do it cheaply. We want to do it cheaply for multiple reasons. One, saving on costs. We don't need to always have an active DR site. Maybe we only want to have a cold site or a warm site with reduced capacity. Maybe we need to have multiple sites and we have a temporary need. So when, let's say it's not DR, let's say it's also business expansion. We have a partnership that's going to last 120 days for a contract. And we need to extend our network to a remote location that we don't plan on having permanent assets there for. Here's the cloud. AWS has multiple points of presence. We can deploy that in different availability zones or a different region and replicate our data accordingly with the right connectivity. This is the lift and shift model, and it's a great way to expand the network or create disaster recovery requirements with very minimal refactoring or requirements to change your architecture as a whole. Next is platform as a service. When you think platform as a service, think of microservices. Microservices are considered decoupled architecture, decoupled. We mean decoupled, we mean the same, but we're used to programming and building things as one application. When you install an application, such as a game, you're installing one game and it has everything you need to use every part of the game. Now imagine having a different function for different portions of your game. You might log in if you're using multiplayer. You might have a single player campaign. You might have an option screen with different functions for uh, changing the way your, your character looks on the screen. These are all different functionalities of your game. And so the same thing happens with enterprise applications. Rather than have all these functions built in, why not reuse functions together across multiple applications? These are called microservices again. So we're going from one large application where you have to develop constantly and possibly break code if you make a change that might affect other functions into isolated, very well-structured APIs. Now, when we say microservices, we're using the same APIs. And the reason why we say APIs uh, or application pro uh, programming interface is that we're saying, make it a separate function. Maybe I want to reuse the user's services code because the login authentication and requirements I need is going to be great for next application. So why not reuse it? Why have to put this and throw it away and rebuild it and duplicate code? I can make it as a service. Also with threading and other uh, items such as a post, so posting in uh, creations of different content altogether, that could be its own API and a separate function. And again, it could be reused in a completely separate application than the one I originally deployed. This reusability is called microservices. So when you think of AWS examples, AWS Lambda is pretty much function as a service. That's also PaaS. Uh, simple storage service, which is S3, which allows you to upload potentially unlimited objects. And the simple queuing service, which is SQS, ironically the first made generally public in 2006, serviced by Amazon Web Services. So it wasn't actually virtualization or with EC2 creating your virtual instances in the cloud. SQS was actually the first service. Now, a simple queue service basically says, hey, I want to add a buffer in between here and here. Let's say we have uh, events coming to and from these microservices. So I have microservices one, two, and three. I, let's say I create an SQS queue. So instead of these things talking together and trying to go around each other in, in a network in a chain and rely on that chain of networking, why don't we just say we have a simple buffer, which is our SQS queue, and then we all tie ourselves into that. Whenever we push stuff, we can take data in, take that data out, and process that data accordingly in a high availability fashion. I don't have to worry about this, the infrastructure underneath. It's all done by AWS, hence 
platform as a service. Now, let's talk a little bit more about AWS S3. We'll sidestep um, before going to software as a service. I think we all have a pretty good understanding here. But let's talk a little bit more about S3. S3 is simple storage, uh, simple storage service is pretty much object storage. Object storage means you have one extrapolation. So if I'm creating a file and I upload that file, that file is considered an object. There is no idea of block storage or file storage. Nothing in it itself is a file. Now, if you look back to your different Linux modules and different Linux learnings, you saw that file systems were actually just pointers to different block storage clusters. So my file might be between clusters 0, 1, and 2 for my entire file. And I have to reference that file using a file system, hence file storage. Notice that these little nodes here that point to different clusters or blocks inside of block storage, yeah, that's actually an extrapolation in itself. Object storage takes on one additional abstraction. Everything's an object. So there's no such thing as a directory or structure and there's no such thing as, hey, I need to find offset uh, four through uh, seven, for instance, or five through seven, for instance. I don't care. Everything is a single object. I reference that object by its uh, key value pair, and that's it. I don't have to worry about offsets or anything like that. The disadvantage to that is that S3 is meant for internet-based storage. Now, internet-based storage or object-based storage, uh, usually interchangeable, but they're not the same. Object storage, remember that it's a slower. The more you extract, the slower it is. So block storage is being the fastest, directly connected to your local system. The file system storage is based on top of that. It's in tandem with your operating system, and it's a layer on top. Object storage is a layer on top of that. And so because it's slower storage, you also have the issues where if you upload an object, you have to upload the entire object in full. There is no partial uploads. If something fails, you have to re-upload it. With that said, there's great things to be done with object storage, especially with S3. There's unlimited storage capacity. There's per region what we call bucketing. So think of every object storage hard drive as S3 buckets, your own personal bucket of objects. And it has to be a globally unique name. You can't just say, I want to be Jeff Bezos.S3, right? You can't just be that. Someone has already taken that. And as long as that other party is using it, you can't have it. But it's also great for data lakes. So if you have to create analysis on top of these objects, you can reference the objects directly as opposed to trying to find offsets based on bits and bytes. So object-based storage has its needs, block storage, block storage has its needs and its places as well. Just know that the internet and internet net networking facing applications, using S3 for object-based storage, is more than acceptable for many things, including static web hosting. Now, another platform as a service is AWS Lambda. Now, the Lambda basically has a special term inside programming. Lambda in Python means that you're creating a temporary function. What do I mean by temporary? It only gets created in memory at runtime. So if you're creating and calling a function inside Python-based Lambdas, it doesn't actually get into memory until you actually invocate it. And that's why AWS calls its Lambda function Lambda. So, what are the limits? Well, you have a max of 15 minute run times. And at the time of this recording, you can only go from 128 megabytes of memory all the way up to 10, 10 gigabytes. You can do this in 64 megabyte chunks. But remember that you can't control the CPU. It scales with you as you increase, increase your memory requirements. So remember, this is function as a service. So if you create a function, so in programming, you might have a function that is for math. And let's say you want to create uh, find the perimeter. Right, you might have the uh, P1 function, and you have something that ingests here, which is, hey, I need to say what, how many, what my length and my width are for my various sides, and I'll say these like here. I'll call that function, and it runs and returns to me a value, and that's all it does. That's what you should think about with AWS Lambda, a single-purpose function. Now you can have bad practices, which we call empty patterns, that we'll learn later on in today's uh, lectures, but keep in mind that. It can create and run native runtimes, including Docker, .NET, Python, Node.js, and a few others. It also scales with you based on your memory requirements. So like I said, there was 128 megabyte minimum through a 10 gigabyte maximum. Wow, that's, that's quite a bit. And you can also have multiple lambdas invoked. So if the lambda gets called multiple times and something's still running um, and taking up that 15 minute space, it will create another lambda instance inside the AWS environment, and it'll keep scaling for as long as your AWS account has that quota restriction 
um, up to its max. So when you think of AWS Lambda function as a service, if something happens where I upload an image to my S3 bucket as an object, the object creates an event. Hey, I said I put an object here, so I put object, and that's an event. I can say my Lambda should look out for this event inside CloudWatch events, which is another version of watching log files, and it invokes my Lambda function to do something. Let's say I wanted to resize that image into a mobile-friendly space. It'll automatically do that for me, and it invoked it. Notice that I have no operating system, no patching, no reference to hardware. All I need to know is I'm running Python, for instance, I'm running Python 3. Here's what I need for libraries. And I'm going to run it based on whatever it was invoked from the put object method. What kind of image is being sent to S3? I'm going to yoink it, do something with it, and then stop my runtime. Short lived, short requirements, cheaper pricing, faster performance. We also have another one that I mentioned earlier AWS SQS, or Simple Queuing Service. Now, queue is just exactly what it sounds like. When you queue up, when you're checking out a line from when you're coming out of a grocery store, for instance, you are in queue. You're in queue to be processed for your groceries and you need to pay for them. And there's that is first in, first out, usually the case, unless you want to be nice if someone needs to cut you, for instance. But almost always, that's a standard queue. Now, there's two types of queuing inside AWS. There's the standard queue, which means there could be multiple events. And there could be multiple orders, depending on uh, the, the load and how many events you're pushing per second. Or there's first in, first out, which you typically do as a human when you're waiting in line at the store. First in, first out has a less performance. Standard has more performance depending on your application needs. You can use either one. Just remember, it's a buffer. So if there's more customers than the four uh, clerks at the restu uh, restaurant uh, checkout can handle, right? if you have 100 customers that are trying to check out all at the same time, grab their checks and leave, you're going to have a queue. You need to have a queue. Otherwise, you're going to drop customers or you might have some being run, running off, unfortunately. And so that queue is an, an important buffer for between the data producer and the data consumer to actually have that high availability, high resiliency. Again, SQS, think of buffer, and it's also a platform as a service. You don't have to worry about the queue being overloaded or anything like that or the queue going down, the operating system, the patches, none of that. Again, platform as a service. Now, finally, we all know what SaaS is in, in the context of you're using SaaS right now, potentially. If you're using Zoom, if you're using Office 365, if you're using Salesforce or any kind of application that's available to you from the cloud, and you don't have to do any programming for the most part, you're using a software as a service. Now, you only have to worry about how you use it and what data that you put in and out. And from a security perspective, if you have authentication requirements, set those authentication requirements accordingly. But remember that SaaS just means turnkey for a very specific business use case, all right, turnkey. Now, you can also still program and be a DevOps for a SaaS program, but you don't have to program from the ground up anymore. You can program and integrate and enrich and enhance and focus on what you need to do for your business as opposed to focusing on trying to get the video feed going. Now, remember that SaaS applications, because they're fully built and they're not PaaS or IaaS, it costs a little bit more to use, but if the right proper pricing or scaling is used, maybe it might cost you less and you can spend more time integrating your SaaS into something else that you need as opposed to building it from the ground up. Can you do better than Zoom? Can you do better than Amazon Chime? Can you do better than Microsoft with 365 with their integrated exchange and calendar capabilities? Probably not by yourself, especially if you're trying to use the same product offering. So think about that when you're creating your solutions. Next, we also talk about shared responsibilities. Now, remember that AWS is a provider and you are the customer, regardless of your DevOps or not. AWS is responsible for the security of the cloud. So all the infrastructure, all the things that go with building, maintaining a data center physically, uh, networking, all the underlying backbone, the different connections, uh, fire suppression systems, everything that goes with everything, managing a data center, the servers, that is security of the cloud, including the security of the proprietary technology and their secret sauce uh, at the cybersecurity level. Now, security in the cloud is your responsibility as a customer and DevOps. So what does in the cloud mean? That means all your customer data. And depending what kind of services you use, remember that even with some SaaS services and all PaaS, uh, PaaS or IaaS, 
you have to manage the identity, authentication, and authorization. Now, when you get to IaaS, then you have to do things such as EC2, right? You have to do uh, all the encryption yourself. You have to worry about encryption in flight, which means something like encryption over the data wire as you're making network connections, such as TLS certificates for as you log into your bank account. Patching, network firewall, networking configuration, how bits are transferred, that's still your responsibility at the IS level. The, when it becomes their responsibility, and, uh, when this actually gets shifted up, is when you start using PaaS level requirements, PAA, PAAS, Platform as a Service. So you can think of an AWS Lambda, uh, SQS, S3, all that is somewhat shared by you and AWS at the same time, depending on how far, what kind of services you use. Now, let's take for example S3. It's a bucket, it's storage. They're still responsible for all up here, but you have the option of not having encryption enabled. So really, although you're not responsible specifically for implementing that encryption, <coughs> and you're not specifically responsible for memorizing that encryption or implementing that encryption, but you still have to configure it yourself. Let's go back to that real quick. And then finally, you have, uh, let's think about SAS. Now, SAS doesn't alleviate you from security responsibilities. You are still responsible for all the data that you put in, use and in and out, and sometimes the configuring the authentication. You don't have to implement the authentication, such as usernames and passwords, how it gets done. You simply have to make sure you actually use it. Again, AWS is all about security of the cloud. You are still responsible for security in the cloud. All right, so let's move on. Account tenancy practices. We talked about single versus multiple account in our earlier learning plan and objectives. Let's see what that really means. Now, a single account with user groups. So, like I mentioned, Regardless if you're SAS, you're PaaS, or IS, you have to create your own users and passwords. While you may not implement it yourself, you still have to create that, that organizational layer. So you might have developers or DevOps. You might have a security team. You might have IT admins. And, you, and even then, you might have regular users. So maybe we'll say uh, users right here, like corporate users, HR, for instance. And I'll just say Sally. Uh, sorry for anyone that has the one named Sally. Just thinking of that. Now, you, we have organizational units accordingly, and we have a single account, Uno account, single account. So we have one account. We have multiple logical separations into operational units, uh, which are user groups. You can have multiple users in different groups. But so, some, for instance, let's say you have an IT person that also needs administrative access. You can have them in the security and admins group inside AWS. We have something called IAM that is in use. That's the service that's called Identity Authentication Management. And that's a service that's pretty much global um, across all AWS accounts. But there's a downside to this. Even though it seems really easy to administrate, but you just create it just like you do on premise. What if you had multiple entities? What if you had perhaps multiple regional needs? Let's say you're not just in Houston. Let's say I'm in Houston, but you're not in Houston. You need to create another organization that is owned by your organization as a parent company somewhere else, and you need those segmented. You need different resources. Well, a single account might get a little stuffy because you'll have to create different OUs or restructure these OUs to say with a prefix, oh, I have partner one, uh, I have uh, a child parent two, pa partner parent one, and you have to specify those via prefix. That still requires a significant amount of effort and administration overhead. But if you're a smaller organization, and there's no plan for growth, and there's no one in your organization other than the developers or security or IT admins using these groups, and they're very small, it might be okay for your needs. Check with your local legal department and your security and compliance departments for other requirements uh, based on segregation. Now, there's also a concept of single account VPCs or virtual private cloud networks. Now, VPCs don't mean that, oh, you have multiple clouds. You still have one account but you have virtual private cloud networks. So VPC, although it's an AWS term, there's also VPCs in Microsoft Azure, VPCs in Google Cloud Platform, and it's just a standardized way of saying, I have a separate network segment altogether. Notice based on IP addresses, we have 
a 10 120 slash 16 and we have we have 10 110 slash 16. Now with that said, I have two separate networks. Now that actually gives us a little more flexibility. <clears throat> let's say we have DevOps. And let's say we have DevOps that we need to have a production environment and a non-production environment. And so we can actually create separate VPCs all together to give them that space inside our account without affecting the rest of the corporate network, maybe perhaps in the cloud. We might also separate by user functions. So IT admins utilize these resources and regular corporate users utilize these resources accordingly. And while that might isolate things at the infrastructure as a service level, think about this. A platform as a service level can still be able to be accessed by either one of these two, such as SQSQ. So we'll say SQSQ, that's my version of a buffer. And again, they can both access this. That's not true logical separation from that perspective if you're using those services. Same thing with S3. If you have S3 buckets, these both can still access these services. Now, remember that this is still okay for multiple VPCs, and that's perfectly fine if you still have a, a small to medium-sized organization and you just need to have multiple different types of environments, hence prod and non-prod, and your isolation only goes as far as what? Infrastructure as a service levels. Now, the other thing is we can't have overlapping cyber blocks or classless inner domain routing. So notice that 10.1.10 and 10.1.20 cannot be overlapping. And the same thing if you create another VPC, you couldn't make a 10.1.10 uh, or 10.1.10.1.0 uh, slash 24 VPC because why? This is already assigned and allocated. In fact, you can't even make anything lower than a slash 16 um, inside of your VPCs in most cases. Now we get to the most best practice, which is multi-account hub and spoke model with AWS. Many people talk about hub and spoke. In the AWS land, we have the concept of everyone is a tenant within their own account. Now let me pause there for a second. Everyone is a tenant in their own account. What does that mean, Dennis? Well, it means you can use your account for however you wish. There's no such thing as a tenant within your account. You are that tenant. There is a single owner or entity and how you use it is not up to AWS. Now, with that said, that means we have to use multiple accounts at this point. Now, with AWS, there's something called AWS organization. So if you have a large organization that's usually multinational, multi-regional, you might have developer teams that are focused around, focusing around HR. You might have development teams that are focused around customer-facing applications and needs if you're a consulting organization. Then that's when you need multiple accounts. You will have a master or root account here that has delegation and access requirements to centralize managing what is allowed in each organizational unit, which could be HR or even by region, such as uh, the US or even Canada. You can separate these however you want. Now, ultimately you still have multiple accounts and now you can say, I still have multiple VPCs. So I can still have my non-prod and prod environments but I can now segregate it based on what? Geographic needs, business function needs, or even entities such as uh, your child-based, uh, if you bought out a company, your acquisition, your acquisition would be under this organizational unit perhaps. And these could be nested in itself. So remember, when you think about hub and spoke, you can think of it as a centralized made way of management. You have your hub here, which is kind of managing all your needs and you have your different spokes coming out for each of these based on different accounts. Remember, hub and spoke in AWS land means always multiple accounts, usually one as a centralized management account, primary or root account, whatever you want to call it. And the service for that is AWS organizations. All right, let's take a 15 minute break and we'll come back with a nice demonstration and we'll see you then. Hi, and welcome back from your break. Hope you had a great one. Let's get back to our demonstration here. What I have up in here in front of me is the AWS global presence, right? With all of our points of presences and our global infrastructure map here. Each of these, as I highlight them accordingly, are different regions. Now, regions are exactly what they sound like. It's AWS's data center presence in these different regions, but it's not just a data center. It's actually multiple data centers. When we call a data center on our cells on premise, which could include multiple buildings, right? A single data center could be um, self-hosted. Now, availability zones or AZs 
are actually the smallest unit of how uh, Amazon Web Services operate. So each region, as you can see here, has a minimum of three zones in most cases, and might have additional ones coming soon. So just know that regions and coming soon, we're spreading AWS across many different uh, cap capabilities across the, the world. And so depending where your users are, you'll want to create your resources in that specific regional portion of the, the global map. So I've signed into my console right here. My console is on my personal account. And right now I'm using a single account, but this remember this is non-production and I'm a single entity, it's just Dennis. Again, we have the notion of regions. So as you have different services, and if you get ever lost or confused, a little tip is to always check your region. Are you operating in the same region as you deployed your service? So remember that uh, I'm using US2, uh, but you can always use US East 1, whatever makes sense to you from your region's closest uh, point of presence. And we talked about infrastructure as a service, software as a service, and platform as a service. All the stuff in your management console will be primarily either infrastructure as a service with EC2 based uh, portfolios, or you might have platform as a service, which is pretty much a lot of these. You can go all services here and it gets really, really difficult. So the best thing to know is you can do a search in here. Now, from our perspective, what makes a infrastructure as a service? What is EC2? Well, EC2 stands for Elastic Compute. Um, so here we go. I'll type in EC2 here, use the console, and what we have here is the EC2 console. I actually have an instance running, and I have an instance running, and that is a virtual machine right now. That virtual machine right here is based on the fact that I have something hosted, and it has its own uh, operating system, which we call uh, Amazon Machine Image as a location for them. I have to control the security, the ports. Um, these are my equivalent of my firewall inbound ports uh, at the host level. Um, and lots of different mappings and stuff like that. So let's see what, it gave me a public IP address. Let's see what I have here and see if we can access the, the web page accordingly. I, it looks like I can't access that, but, and here is my test web page uh, for, for that's being hosted by my account um, inside the US East 2 Ohio region. I have status checks and notice that I can also sign in to the host as well. So if I uh, downloaded the key pair and used SSH, I could actually do that. We have a uh, creation of other items and security groups here. So our security groups are equivalent, again, based on uh, inbound and outbound most center security groups as a host-based firewall set. Now remember, this is infrastructure as a service. EC2 means I have to control everything at the operating system um, and the network configuration below that on up. Now when I say network configuration, I don't mean the hardware, but I do mean how it things get routed, where things go. And again, that is based on that. To go into platform as a service, we have another service like S3. Now S3 here, as soon as that loads, um, you have things like buckets, the whole idea of buckets. And what I have here is a pub object can be public, which is a security issue in most cases. But this bucket is also considered regional. It's in, uh, even though it says it's a global item, I have that bucket in a regional perspective. So. Uh, if I create, I can actually create a new bucket here. And again, I have to create the bucket in a very specific region. You can create, it has to be a unique name. So if I uh, did test, for instance, it might tell me that test is already taken. Or if I say uh, Jeff Bezos, that bucket might be already taken as well. We'll see what happens. And I need it, and remember, even though encryption is not necessarily an uh, implementation requirement on my end, I don't need to program it. I still have to enable it, so I'm going to enable encryption. I'll create that bucket, and it's going to tell me this name already exists. Again, remember, even though S3 is considered um, a regional service, it has to have a globally unique name, all right? So the buckets, even though I have this one um, in use, let's create a different bucket for myself. So I'll create a new bucket. Say um, we'll use X Tech Systems, which is kind of my little company alias. I'm going to say block all public access for security. Um, the, the best thing to do is always add tags. We'll cover that in a different lecture. I'll enable encryption, create the bucket. And what I have is something right here. And I can go ahead and upload a file. So I'll upload an object. I can upload multiple things. So I'll add uh, multiple objects together. So I'll upload, mm, I'll upload a, a set, some static content. So maybe this YAML file here. We'll upload that. 
And if it didn't complete, then it would be failure. And now we have access to our, um, our contents in this, in this bucket right here. And even though it looks like it creates a directory structure, I have to access it via a, a key value pair, which is right here. Notice the URL accordingly. Um, and a Amazon resource name is a very specific identifier that you would use in reference as you're creating different things. Um, I have my storage classes and all the great things that go with it. And of course, I can go ahead and delete that. Remember, if you do store anything in create a bucket, you will be charged money. So be sure to, if you're following along, to always, always uh, remember to remove and delete everything that you're not using anymore. Otherwise, you will be charged for that uh, resource. So I'm going to go ahead and delete all those objects and then finally delete the bucket itself. Um, so I will go ahead and delete this bucket. I'll type in my name here. And that's an example of a platform as a service. Now, what was I doing? I was actually creating API calls all that time, and it actually creates events. So I can go to CloudTrail, which tracks API events. I can create a trail or use event history in here that already has something. Um, and what I have here is everything I've been doing, what I have, what I've been requested, all the things that have gone, uh, gone happening between them. You notice I st still have stuff here in April and, and June, and so. This keeps track of every API, API call at the control plane level as what I need. Again, this is also a platform as a service. I don't have to request anything. I don't have to understand what the servers are patched and make sure that there's security here. I simply have to use it, but I still have to configure what I want from it. So that was just something to showcase to you between um, IaaS and PaaS. Now in the future lectures and modules, you'll learn about more automation and coding. And one last thing I want to leave you all with is that remember, monitor your accounts always using the billing uh, dashboard. So billing details, billing dashboard, these are all great things to make sure your account is following the, uh, the best needs. So uh, I don't want the documents. I actually want maybe Cost Explorer. All right, so Cost Explorer is actually part of billing. We click on the billing uh, item here and then you'll get your dashboard. Notice I've spent 42 cents in the last month um, because I don't really have anything running and make sure you actually enable your, uh, your preferences here. So if you go to billing preferences, you can also enable your weekly emails to yourselves. You can, I don't really care, feel free to email me uh, with any feedback you may have about this course. <laughs> and of course, uh, there's also one thing I want to show you, which is also a platform as a service, almost like a SaaS, not quite, uh, is Trusted Advisor. The Trusted Advisor will also give you some of the well-architected framework recommendations to your account specifically and I'll check periodically. You can also have it email you based on the, the preferences right here. So that's it for today's lecture and demo. I hope you had a great time. We'll see you in the next lecture.